Now, given those examples we saw uh, about attributing random negative events to, to a curse or something like that, and attributing random positive events to a magic pill or something like that, once you've made that false connection, that faulty connection, it would be really hard to, to sort of unsee it, right? You, you experienced it. You saw that when you were sick and you took this, you got better. You saw that when you took an exam and then you did this, uh, you did worse, right? It, it, that, that experience is real. And I know I, I do this myself. Once I see that connection, it's very hard for me to change my opinion if somebody tells me that 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 is not operating. That's right, and I th that's exactly right. And I think with opinion change, it's, it's n as we said before, it's not enough just to uh, say that people uh, like their own opinions or something like that. And instead, it's, it's really important to figure out why people are so resistant to opinion change. Uh, the intellectual reasons, the cognitive reasons, the, the machinery, the processes that are operating uh, for that resistance to opinion change. And we're going to talk about those in a second, but I think it's worth um, making it more concrete. So let's give an example. Uh, one, I've used this before in, in some of the classes I've taught. Uh, and we ask people, um, imagine yourself given the choice between a large class, between taking a, a class with, you know, 500, 1,000 people sitting in this giant lecture hall watching a professor, uh, or taking a small class, you know, say 20 people, uh, with a lecturer standing at the front giving the same sort of thing. Which would you prefer? Now, most people in that sort of context would say that they would prefer the small class as opposed to the large class. They'll learn, you'll learn more, you get more interaction, and all this stuff. That's right. As we talked about in episode five, that. Uh, you'll learn more. You'll, uh, you'll learn more, you'll retain it for longer if you're in a, in a smaller class than you're in a larger class. But again, going back to episode five, I, in that conversation with John Dunlosky, I asked him about uh, the difference between a large and a small class. And here's what he had to say. So a lot of students think that uh, there's a real benefit to small classes over large classes. I mean, we all have experience in sitting in lecture halls, massive, you know, 500 people in a lecture hall. Uh, versus an intimate sort of 20 people in a lecture hall. Um, is there any evidence that, I mean, we like to think that small classes are substantially better than, than, than large classes. Right. It seems intuitive that they would be, right? Because you get more attention potentially from your teachers and so forth. And there's quite a, quite a bit of evidence, actually, enough evidence to do meta-analysis after meta-analysis. And uh, it turns out that the relationship between class size and uh, student achievement really is really small. In fact, it's almost non-significant in many cases, which is startling yeah. that it would be that way. But in fact, smaller classes aren't necessarily better. So as John just said, there is this experiment of uh, the difference between a large and a small class and the learning outcomes that result. That's been done hun literally hundreds of times. And there has been roughly half of the experiments coming out in favor of a small class and roughly half of the experiments that have been done come out in favor of a large class or no difference between them whatsoever. Now, with this as a background, I, I use this example in my class with my students, and I ask them, okay, well, what do you prefer? And as, as I said, they say, I prefer a small class. And I say, okay, now, I'm going to give you a whole bunch of money. Imagine I'm in a, in a position where I have a heap of research funds, and I give them as much money as they need, and I want them to test the difference between a large class and a small class, design the experiment. And so they do. They, they design this elaborate sort of experiment. They say, and so we've learned a fair bit about the experimental method. So they say things like, well, we have to control as much as possible. So you need the person at the front of the class to be exactly in, uh, in front of the large class, to be the same person in front of the small. Maybe record them. Let's video record the person in the two classes and see being a, an audience member in the large class and being an audience member in the small class, all things being equal. Uh, who's going to learn more? And they design this very elaborate experiment. And then I actually give them the punchline, and I say, okay, we've, this experiment that you've proposed has been done. It's been done, a hundred, it's been done a thousand times, and there has been no difference whatsoever. Now, then I take another poll and say, okay, students, now, how many of you are willing to change your mind? If I 
if I gave you the option of taking a large class and a small class now, how many people are going to take the small class and how many people are going to take the large class? And there's no change. People who decided, the vast majority of them, if not all of them, say I'd take the small class, are still willing to take the small class despite the fact that I said this experiment's been done hundreds of times, despite the fact that there's no evidence to suggest that there's a difference between them. And why? And this is it. I mean, given this overwhelming evidence against the difference between large and small classes, people just will not waver. And then I asked them, okay, well, why? Why, don't, why won't you change your mind? Why would you still continue to take a small class as opposed to a large? And they said, well, I don't know. I like them better. Okay, well, or I don't like the experiment that you, pro that, that you propose. Well, you, you designed propose. the experiment, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, you're the one, and that's why I have them do it, because they're committed. And yet, there just doesn't seem to be any difference. And this is, this is the nature of the problem. I mean, we're using a fairly benign example about small classes and large classes, but we're going to see it come out again and again when we talk about extraordinary claims, ESP and things, when we present evidence to people that doesn't consist with their worldview, what do they do in the face of this of this new evidence. Yep. And when we ask those students to, to take it to the next level, to reflect on why people are reluctant to change their minds, they tend to give motivational explanations. They're like, well, people don't like to look stupid in front of their friends and family. Like, change in their mind, you know, makes them look, you know, intellectually weak or something like that. But those motivational examples aren't enough. We need to focus on the cognitive, uh, the intellectual explanations for why it's so difficult to change your mind. And I think there's two things going on. The first is, it's called source amnesia. We have difficulty remembering why it is we believe something. And think about this. What makes you think you have access that, that you can instantly recall the exact basis for why you read, why you believe something? Oh, yep, I, I read this paper that found this effect, or oh, I remember doing really well in a small class and not in a large class. In 1987. <laughs> yeah, my memory is that good. I'm just pulling it all, and that's why I believe it. So that 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 source amnesia, that difficulty in, in remembering, is, is one of the factors that makes it hard to change your mind. The second thing that makes it difficult to change minds is it's hard to reconcile uh, what it is you believed previously with this new data. And again, that's cognitively difficult. You've got this new evidence that's come in and you have your former belief. That takes some work to put those two things together. It can't be done in the heat of the moment. You have to do some work. It might take, it might take days, it might take weeks for you to, to reconcile this new information with your previous belief. So those are the two things that I think make it difficult for, for people, for us, to change our opinions. So it's, it, it's not enough to say that, that that people are silly to give these motivational explanations. We have to look at why it's difficult to change minds. So evidence alone is not enough to change minds. You need evidence plus a good story. You need to show people what they can change their minds to. That's right. And I think going back to the large class, small class difference or example, uh, I would have been extremely surprised if I asked my students after just presenting a couple papers or um, on my authority to say that now nah, there's no difference between a large and a small class. If they just spun on a dime right there and said, okay, I'll take a large class instead of a small class, I would have been astonished if they would have done that. And for exactly the right reasons. I think, as you said, it takes work. It takes an enormous amount of effort to reconcile the information, this new wealth of evidence that they've just uh, that they've just been exposed to. How do you integrate that with a lifetime of experience? It's really difficult. And so we're going to help, I think. Next, we're going to talk about six leads of opinion change. Now, these are things that students uh, in the course can use when they're encountering new evidence that contradicts a belief that they hold dear. So for themselves or for other people. So. And I've done this myself. These are really kind of useful tools to be able to say, OK, well, here's something I believe. I, this is a belief that I hold dear. Um, and I've just been presented with evidence that completely obliterates what I had thought was true. Now, what do what I do, do I about do? that? Yeah. Right? So what are some of these six leads that we can deal with?